I'm sure we all know uh, the, the famous quote of uh, Abba Ibn, the legendary uh, first Israeli ambassador to the UN and later foreign minister, uh, who famously said that if Algeria had introduced a resolution declaring that the earth was flat and that Israel had flattened it, it would pass by a vote of about 164 to 13 with 26 abstentions. And now, sadly, uh, that was only the slightest of exaggerations at the time, and even sadder, little has changed since the time these words were spoken by Abba Ibn. But it wasn't always this way, uh, and I think this is not as appreciated as it could be, particularly among members of my generation. Uniquely, Israel was born among all of the UN member states, nearly all of the member states, uh, with the imprimatur of the world body, which itself arose from the ashes of World War II and the Holocaust, and uh, with the UN serving uh, at that time, or after World War II, uh, as a focal point of so, uh, so many hopes, not least Jewish hopes. Uh, and so cooperation with Israel, aspiration, cooperation with the UN, aspiration to cooperation with the UN, uh, was a pillar of Israel's early foreign policy under Ben-Gurion. Uh, and perhaps even more shocking, even to some in this crowd, the UN was referenced positively in Israel's very declaration of independence, not once or even twice, but seven times. So what happened? Uh, in a nutshell, and this is perhaps a, a bit of an oversimplification, the process of decolonization as uh, uh, long awaited and as overdue as it was, not only dramatically multiplied during the height of the Cold War, uh, the number of UN member states, uh, but it led in short order uh, to a marriage of convenience between anti-US and anti-Israel forces, creating what we call an automatic majority, including nearly 60 OIC, uh, Organization of the Islamic uh, Conference or Cooperation members, uh, and what I might some, sometimes describe as uh, a democracy of tyrannies. And so, I'll sum it up, I'll tell us all what we sadly know. By now, uh, Israel is often condemned in countless UN fora, uh, including those dealing with uh, issues as specialized as uh, women's rights, water, labor issues, not only more often or more than any single one of the world's most dangerous regimes, uh, but often, again, more than the rest of the entire international community, the other 193 member states combined. And Israel alone at the UN is excluded from not only its natural regional group, which would be the Asian group, uh, but from full participation in any regional group at the UN with some practical consequences. Israel alone is subjected to scrutiny under a dedicated permanent agenda item and is subjected to a radical so-called special rapporteur or investigator uh, with a mandate to investigate only Israel's alleged wrongdoings, not those of the Palestinians. And this special rapporteur explicitly promotes anti-Israel BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns, rather than peace diplomacy. And over the past decade, as again we sadly know, in an echo of the uh, infamous Zionism as Racism Resolution of 1975, which I think marched, marked the, the low point uh, of Israel's uh, otherwise um, or already difficult relationship with the UN, uh, the Durban anti-racism process has singled out the world's only democratic Jewish state, Israel, for implied characterization as racist. And meanwhile, the Palestinians, for their part, the Palestinians alone have three standing components, three standing units of the UN bureaucracy, uh, the Division on Palestinian Rights, the Committee on uh, the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People, and the Committee to Investigate Israeli Practices, dedicated on a full-time basis to the worldwide propagation of Palestinian narratives and political goals. And the Palestinians are the only people with a UN Day of Solidarity and a dedicated refugee agency, apart from the body handling, under different terms entirely, all of the world's other refugees. And of course, the UN, as we know, itself a member of the International Peacemaking Quartet, which implored the resolution of outstanding issues through direct negotiation between the parties themselves, has now unilaterally recognized the Palestinians of all other nationalist, separatist, and conflicting parties in the world as a so-called non-member state. Uh, and this, 
even as the western flank of that Palestinian state that doesn't yet exist, is ruled by the terrorist organization Hamas, while even the Palestinian Authority's UN mission, 65 years, this year, 65 years after rejecting the two-state solution uh, in the GA's uh, partition, Resolution 181 of 1947, continues to refuse to speak of Israel as a Jewish state. And the mission, I have a copy, I think, with me of, of the letterhead from just a few weeks ago, features on its official insignia. This is the Palestinian Authority and its Palestine Liberation Organization, a map showing all of Israel as Palestine. And finally, if it weren't bad enough that the UN clearly insists on considering Israeli settlements, which are contentious, but Israel has proven aren't necessarily permanent, if need be, not only does the UN insist on considering settlements, the one greatest obstacle to peace, as even a Western European ambassador put it to me just a few weeks ago, it has at the same time not only ignored, but sometimes been complicit in the anti-Israel incitement whose deadly results for Israelis and ultimately Palestinians alike is all too irreversible. Last year, to take just one example, Bnei Brith found that one typical prominent Arab political cartoonist who had portrayed Israelis and Jews over, over the course of years as monsters, as crucifiers, as Nazis, and everything else in between had been featured or had featured on his client list very openly multiple UN agencies, including UNICEF, the UNDP, UN Women, and others, as well as major multinational corporations. And beyond the threat of further politicization and exploitation of UN arms to vilify, isolate, and harm Israel, including now the possibility of ICC, International Criminal Court Prosecution, uh, in The Hague, the Arab, uh, Ar the Arab bloc, diplomats of the Arab bloc, have helped to effectively frame UN decisions over the course of years as the source of what they frequently call international legitimacy. And the implications of this UN claim to the ultimate moral and legal authority has very real implications in each of the realms that I'm told we'll be discussing this morning, including, I'm sure, uh, the, uh, the mainline Protestant groups that, uh, that I know Noam will, will discuss uh, in a few minutes. And now to, to close the, the synopsis, I think uh, Natan Sharansky uh, just a few years ago, very helpfully uh, delineated what separates fair, reasonable criticism of Israeli policy from something else and entirely unacceptable. He called them the three Ds, demonization, delegitimization, and double standards. And undoubtedly, too often we've seen these three Ds in action at the UN. But we've also had some successes, and I'm, I'm sorry I haven't had time uh, to discuss them as of yet. Perhaps we can cover some of them during the Q&A. Uh, but ultimately, um, when I look out my window, my office window in New York, and I, I see the flag of Israel flying atop uh, its UN mission, as the grandchild of, of Holocaust survivors, uh, I'm reminded that with the help of all its friends, both within the Jewish community and outside, uh, Israel has not only survived 65 years of tremendous uh, relentless challenges, one after the other, but in, in many ways uh, Israel has thrived. And, and so I think our event today, uh, your event today, uh, is a perfect example of the very solidarity and devotion that has made this possible. And so I'd like to thank you again, uh, uh, all of you, for your commitment, all the good, good work that, that you do, and, and thank you again for, for the invitation to be here today. So I work for the Israel Project, which was started 10 years ago by three mothers who had this vision of changing how Israel was perceived in the media because they had young children and said, I don't want when my children grow up to have to see this assault on Israel in the media. So why, and you know, over the years, the Israel Project still continues to work with the press. Why do we work with the press? Where do most people get their information about the Middle East? newspapers, television, online news sources. So that's why it's so important to make sure that journalists are educated about issues so that way the material that they write, which all of you read, all of the American public reads, um, they then have the accurate information that they can learn from. We are all aware of various double standards. Um, so basically, my background's in the media. 
before joining the Israel Project three and a half years ago, I was working as a digital journalist for NBC News. And I saw how the world of journalism is shrinking. Before a, a uh, correspondent would have a producer, a researcher, a camera guy, a tech person, and now it's usually just him or herself walking around with a camera, no researcher, no one to kind of help back up. Add in the 24-7 news environment, and the work of a journalist is really difficult. So here's what the Israel Project tries to do. We reach out to the journalists before a story's ever written. We establish relationships. Um, we get to know what they're planning to write about and make sure that we're there as a resource for them. I'll give you an example. When um, Israel attacked the weapons convoy on the Syria-Lebanon border at the same exact time, my colleagues in our Jerusalem office were in the process of putting on a briefing with an expert on Syria. We had planned that knowing that tensions were brewing and wanted to get ahead of the story. In our Washington office, we held a private briefing for a few journalists with a local expert on Syria. In addition, we reached out to more journalists, getting them in contact with experts to really give full context. And then we sent out other information via social media, emails, etc. So um, what is it that you can do? Well, one thing that the Israel Project provides for you is something called the daily tip. It's an email that goes out each morning with just a few bullet points. And it highlights the major issues going on in the Middle East region, linking back to various news stories so you can be in the know about what's going on, what is being covered, how it's being covered, and what, the, what information that you should have in case if you wanted to talk about something. In order to help combat any assaults on Israel legitimacy um, in the media, you need to get ahead of the story, provide background information, access to experts before the story is even written, and it's possible to make it happen. Thank you. So I want to do three quick things, and then we can flesh it out during the questions and answers. I want to give you an overview of the role of religion and churches in America, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Second, to tell you what the current reality is. And third, what it is that we as Jewish professionals do, and what it is specifically that you can do in order to deal with religiously motivated attacks upon Israel. The first thing to begin with is the good news. Thank God we live in the United States of America. Thank God the American-Israeli alliance is strong. Thank God religion in America is primarily supportive of Israel. At the end of the day, we are living in a primarily Christian country. It's about 75% Christian. The overwhelming majority of Americans, the overwhelming majority of Americans who are Christian, because the overwhelming majority of Americans are Christian, are strongly supportive of Israel. You know this, we all know this. What we are dealing with is a loud and vocal and active minority that is using religious framework to challenge the majority, and the majority needs to react. I can't talk about all religions today, but of course Christianity is very diverse. And although you know that the overwhelming support of evangelicals is well known in this country, and is part of the alliance of support for Israel, the truth is that there are weaknesses not only within the evangelical community, but also, obviously, within the liberal Protestant community, which is our main focus. Why do we care about religion and, and its expression? Why do we care if liberal Protestant denominations are presenting resolutions in light of BDS or letters to Congress challenging military aid to Israel on human rights, alleged human rights violations? The answer is that although even within the liberal Protestant denominations that are decreasing as a percentage of religious influence in America, they still have a great influence on the elites in America. Almost none of the American presidents have identified outside of the liberal Protestant denominations. 70, 80 percent of US Congress emanates from these denominations because the power elite and opinion shapers are still coming from this 
classic founding fathers approach of the United States, where the liberal Protestants played an outside role and now are playing a lesser role. What is the current reality? The current reality is that primarily within the liberal Protestant denominations, and you know them best as Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Methodists, Lutherans, and a handful of smaller groups, which by the way, notwithstanding what I said earlier, uh, a, a, not a very well-known secret among American Jewry is that uh, there are more American Jews than Presbyterians and Episcopalians together in the United States. Shocking, but true. They have an outsized influence in the United States, but demographically, they are shrinking. Nonetheless, we have to take it seriously because of the influence that I spoke about earlier. And any demonization of Israel needs to be met head on and challenged with real facts. What are they doing? A small minority within these denominations is hijacking the agenda of their national conventions and presenting resolutions calling for boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. Some of their leadership out of sync with their own surveys of their own denominations, which are of course overwhelmingly supportive of Israel, and basically just want to be left alone to go to church and follow their religious principles and not be engaged in the smearing of Israel. Notwithstanding that, they go ahead with letters to Congress challenging Israel's right to military aid as the front line against terrorism, alleging human rights violations, and the like. The good news is that our friends within these churches are doing the heavy lifting in preventing this from happening. I know we would like to think that it's the American Jewish establishment and all of us who are doing the heavy lifting, but the truth is that we need to applaud and thank our friends within these denominations who have been able to go up and speak truth to power within their own denominations, and we are grateful to them for doing that. We cannot take it for granted. <laughs> Nonetheless, the margin for error is very small. The Presbyterians defeated divestment by two votes out of seven, eight hundred that were cast at their general assembly. That means that when Jewish professionals interact with their fellow professionals within the denominations, and more importantly, when you attend a session in which you meet with religious leadership, as AJC does and the CRC does and others do here in Metro West, and you develop relationships with people, not at a time of crisis, but in advance, over time, and you are on a first-name basis with religious leadership within these denominations. And even in this state, where you were able to turn the vote of a critical member of a committee that was behind these resolutions within the Presbyterian Church, you need to understand that it's like that Jewish proverb, you have to look at the world as if the next thing you do is going to tip the scales for good or for bad. You don't know who it is that you're going to speak to who's going to make a difference and help us turn the tide. I want to conclude with an understanding uh, in the most positive sense of how we do this and what's at stake. We need to take advantage in our religious relationships of the unprecedented positive relationship that Jews have with their fellow religionists, their co-religionists, their Christian religionists, who are their neighbors in a way that has never happened in the history of the Jewish people. All of us live next door to Presbyterians, Methodists, Lutherans. We have casual relationships with them. We need to communicate to them something that their leadership is not telling them, something that the wayward voices within their churches are not telling them. That if you want to have a relationship with the Jewish people, you need to understand the centrality of the Israel experience to American Jewish identity. There's no separation for Jews between religion and ethnicity. There's no separation for Jews between religion and nationality. 
We are loyal American citizens, but we cannot understand ourselves without the centrality of the Israel experience. We need to communicate that to them. And above all, we need to understand that we cannot wake up one morning and hope that people with whom we do not have relationships will be pro-Israel and see the threat from a public relations standpoint of demonizing Israel within the churches. We need to do it in the long run. We need to develop relationships when things are calm, so when there's a challenge, we're ready to meet the task. Thank you very much. I run an organization called the Hasbara Fellowships. Um, our focus is on college campuses. Um, it was mentioned before that uh, there's probably nothing that'll get our blood boiling more than the UN. Could be college campuses are, are up there uh, in, in a close, in a close uh, tie. Um, what's happening on college campuses today? So, no, first of all, one point that has to be made is that no college, all college campuses are different. Depending on geography, the West Coast, East Coast, Canada, the Midwest, very different. Large schools compared to small schools, liberal arts schools compared to tech schools. Universities are different. But on all major universities across North America, there is some degree of anti-Israel propaganda that is present, that is happening on campus. First of all, why campus? So I think there's two points. One is that the population on campus is a vulnerable population. You're talking about young people for the first time often are leaving home, are going to university, uh, are, are generally, and I'm talking about both non-Jewish and Jewish uh, college students have very limited background knowledge about the Middle East, about what's going on in the world, about Israel. So they're vulnerable. They're also open. It's an open atmosphere, an atmosphere to lear learn new things. They haven't cemented their views about the world or Israel yet. And so there's a vulnerable population um, that might not necessarily have the background information to put into context um, propaganda or lies that they might hear. I think there's a second reason why there's a focus on college campus beyond the vulnerable population is that we've seen throughout our history that college campuses often impact the larger society. Uh, movements that have happened in this campus, anti-war movements, uh, civil rights movements, whatever it might be, either have started on college campuses or had a strong influence coming from the college campus. And so I think very strongly that Israel's um, antagonists, are fo they focus on college campus not only to focus on that population, knowing that those will be the next generation of editors and chiefs and politicians and community leaders, but that they really believe if they can make significant headlines or influence on campus, that can then influence the, the greater society. So what's happening on campuses today as far as delegitimization of Israel? So there is activities. Um, some activities, I think, are less influential. You have many speakers that come to campus. You have anti-Israel films that are shown. I say these are less important because generally they attract those people who are interested in coming to you know, an event uh, to hear about um, negative things about Israel generally attracts people who are already anti-Israel. But there are other activities that are more influential and are more impactful and more detrimental to Israel. There's some activities where they don't just go into a classroom and bring, bring a speaker and wait for someone to come to them. They go out onto the campus quad and they try to get a message across to your average student. So we just, we know um, it's happened a number of years in a row. It was just announced that I think the second week, first or second week in March, uh, Israel Apartheid Week will be coming to campus where they set up apartheid walls on campus and public displays and materials. It's not in a classroom somewhere. It's not hidden you know, in, in a back room. It's out in the middle of campus. Uh, they write things in college newspapers condemning Israel, more public activities. Um, but even more dangerous, I believe, are some, I'd say, more sophisticated activities that we're seeing from anti-Israel advocates on campus. Number one, they're making relationships and coalitions with groups, cultural groups, political groups on campus that have nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with the Middle East. Um, black student associations, Asian student associations, uh, you know, gay and lesbian or organizations, Hispanic organizations, reaching out to them, making relationships with them, where we'll see on campuses, yeah, maybe they'll bring a speaker to campus who is there to condemn Israel and we shouldn't even worry about it, but all of a sudden, a cultural organization on campus or a political organization on campus that knows nothing about what's going on in the Middle East will co-sponsor it and advertise it to their membership. Another dangerous area we see is that 
The anti-Israel movement on campus has made a strategic, strategic decision over the last number of years, which is really coming to fruit now, and it's, being, it's very effective to their credit, is getting themselves onto student governments. Um, if people that remember university, have been in university recently, you probably don't remember much about your student government. I don't remember anything, ever hearing anything about my student government. I never voted, I never participated. So you can have a university where a very small percentage of people actually participate, but they can have a very big influence. Influence on budget, influence on PR, because they can make statements that represent the university. And what the detractors of Israel have done is they've put effort into running slates of anti-Israel groups to get under student government, and then they try to, uh, again, put money towards anti-Israel activities that they can do, um, but also try to make statements, divestment statements, where we've seen that uh, in a number of campuses now, and it's increasing where they're trying. Thankfully, we've been successful, um, and I say we, I mean the general pro-Israel community in, in defeating them, but there have been a few successes where they've had, where the student government officially representing the university will pass a bill say, calling for the divestment of all investment funds of the university um, from any companies doing business with Israel. It doesn't mean anything because the university won't do it, but it's a symbolic statement saying Israel is like South Africa, just as the, all people of conscience divested from South Africa, the same thing should happen with Israel today. And finally, another very dangerous factor that I see is that these anti-Israel groups have done a good job as well of getting um, either professors or academic departments on campus to uh, work with them to officially sponsor things they're doing. We saw this last year at Harvard University. They had a one-state uh, conference, which they were able to get, um, I think it was the Kennedy School of Government, to actually put their logo on it, whether they meant to or they didn't do it. It was, it was on there. It gives them a sense of legitimacy when they can put these logos on it, put these names on it. And so those are the much more dangerous things that I think are happening on campus. Just to end, I think that the title of the session is, well, is this having an impact? Um, and I would say two things. One is that on the positive side, all of this has really galvanized, I think, a very um, motivated and now very well trained and very well supported because the Jewish community has done a very good job uh, of, of pro-Israel students on campus who want to step up. And in many campuses, even though there is anti-Israel activity, they are dominating the narrative on campus. They're dominating the debate on campus. They're making the relationships with the important people. It's not enough campuses. And one of the things about campus, good or bad, is that people eventually graduate, hopefully. Um, and so it constantly is changing, and campus change, and the players change. And so we have to constantly keep re-educating and, and helping more students. The, ant the support for anti-Israel sentiment on campus, I don't see it growing, but what is growing is doubt about Israel, where students have questions about whether they can support Israel or not. And so our challenge is to give them reasons why they can support Israel and to build those relationships uh, to give them reasons why. Thank you very much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.